Kinana, and of course, everyone in the energy department, especially Yosef, who was a key pivot in organizing this event, and you will hear and see him later on. Many thanks also to Enlight CEO, Gilad, for agreeing to speak and share his perspective about working with the EBRD from the Israeli company point of view. And it's looked like be a fascinating thing to, to hear. And of course, thank you to Eyal, Zoe from the Ministry of Finance and the guys from SID. So I would just like to say a few words to kick off this uh, webinar and tell you that the future is looking very green for the energy sector. The EBRD invests close to 2 billion euro in the energy sector in the last few years. But if in the past, a significant percentage of the project were not only renewables, but also coal, oil, and gas, we are now discussing these present days between the board of directors and management, how to implement the strategy for the Paris alignment in the near future. And it looks like they're gonna make some change in toward renewables. No more finance to oil, coal, and partly gas. This means from a business point of view, for most of you that the countries that the bank is operating in could be even much more interesting and a lot of opportunities for new projects. So I recommend you to look for investment opportunities in those areas. And I encourage you to get to know the EBRD, which is the main uh, reason for this webinar, of course. Uh, in most countries, the bank, as you can see, is the key investor in the energy sector. And you will hear on from the banker and the energy team that they are well familiar with all sorts of financing options, regulation and opportunities in the different countries. I would like to point out also that the EBRD is a unique organization and it is maybe a little bit more complicated to get to know to work with a bank for an Israeli company for the first time. But I can assure you, and maybe Gilad could elaborate it later about it, that it's worth the effort. There are a lot of repeating customers and after each side get to know each other, there could be much more opportunities in the future. So uh, I hope it will be a very interesting webinar and maybe we can see a lot of more companies from Israel, investors, that try to cooperate with the EBRD in the next green years that are ahead of us. Thank you. Alon is after me? Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for, for the opening remarks and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as I see a lot of uh, new faces, I will just briefly say, uh, my name is Alon and I'm the Director General of Seed Israel, uh, which is an umbrella organization uh, for almost 160 members that are coming uh, from the business, uh, social, uh, governmental and academic sectors. Uh, all of them are involved either in humanitarian aid or international development activity. Uh, our mission is to promote and encourage Israeli responsible and positive involvement in emerging markets. And uh, we consider working with the development banks uh, one of the best ways of doing so. Uh, in, our, in our organization, you, you can find a, a huge database of uh, basically almost all players in Israel who are involved in emerging markets uh, by fields, uh, countries, and sectors. And this is a great way for those of you who are looking for uh, potential partners or uh, uh, potential uh, players who are already familiar with specific uh, places uh, to do it uh, through uh, our uh, database. Um, this is not our first cooperation with EBRD, and it is always a pleasure cooperating with this institute. Uh, and of course, uh, doing it uh, in partnership with the Ministry of Finance. Um, as time is running, uh, just briefly thanks uh, our partners at the Ministry of Finance, Eyal Medan and Zoe, and uh, Alon from EBRD and the rest of the team at the EBRD. And uh, I would like to invite, I'm happy to invite uh, Mr. Alain Pilot, the EBRD Vice President, uh, for welcome and opening remarks. Please, Mr. Pilot. Thank you so much. So uh, I have to start by saying dear Alon and dear Alon, because uh, we have two Alons on, uh, on screen. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much to uh, the Ministry of Finance and uh, to uh, SID uh, Israel for uh, the joint work uh, which has led uh, to this uh, webinar. Um, it was a good experience, I think, for all 
very happy uh, as well to see uh, our friend uh, Gilad uh, Yavetz on uh, on screen, the CEO of Enlight Renewable Energy, uh, an old friend. You know that my uh, uh, my heart is very close to uh, to Israel for many reasons. I've got many friends there. And I'm a regular visitor to the country, at least uh, pre-COVID, and I hope to be a regular visitor again uh, very soon, all the more that the COVID situation is getting uh, really much, much better in, uh, in, in Israel. Um, I will try to be Israeli this morning, short and sharp, uh, <laughs> as, as you all are. Uh, Look, uh, dear, dear guests, first of all, uh, a very short update on, on EBRD. Uh, EBRD is uh, 30 years old, as you can see in the background uh, be, behind me. Uh, EBRD, it is the G7 plus the EU plus very important countries such as uh, Israel, an important shareholder. EBRD it is 38 countries uh, where we uh, operate at the moment, which span from uh, Central Europe, Western Balkans, Southeast Europe, Eastern Europe, Caucasus, Central Asia, uh, up to Mongolia, you know, so close to, uh, to China. Turkey, since 2007, very important country for us, of course, because of its size. And since 2012, uh, a number of Mediterranean countries after the so-called Arab Spring, so Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and also the, the, the West Bank and Gaza, where we entered with uh, support, by the way, uh, full support from uh, Israel. In these countries, what are we doing? We are essentially focusing on the private sector. Not only because, of course, the private sector needs uh, infrastructure, which sometimes has to be public, but uh, the private sector for us, it is 75% of our activities at least every year. And so, of course, we are massively focused on it. The EBRD, it is a debt, but it is also equity. Uh, we, have, uh, we have both uh, instruments. It is sometimes large projects, but sometimes it can be medium-sized or small projects because we work in very different uh, geographies and we had to adapt from day one to various sizes of projects. So we can uh, address your needs, you know, whatever your size. And if we can't anyway, we can refer you to uh, all the banks we are working with in our countries of operations. EBRD, it's also investment plus engagement on reform. And this is very important. I will give you an example in the renewable sector because it's better than, uh, than a long story. In Egypt, where I was all of last week, by the way, I just came back to London uh, yesterday. In Egypt, the Benban uh, solar park could not have happened if we had not worked together with the IFC, by the way, not alone, uh, on uh, the legislation, the regulation, and even the power purchase agreements, uh, which attracted uh, a lot of international investors. So we open markets, uh, dear friends. We don't only invest. We open the markets for you to invest by engaging with the state on the necessary reforms. And of course, it is much broader than the renewable sector, but today we are, we are focused on the renewable sector. Um, of course, like everybody else, we want to be greener and we have committed to our shareholders that by the end of 225, at least 50% of our activity will be green. We want to be more digital. We want also to be more inclusive. But, you know, this is almost obvious in the world where we live. So this is what EBRD is. And... Uh, if somebody tells you that EBRD is slow because it is owned by countries, just tell them that every year we sign more than 400 operations for the more or less $12 billion that we invest every year. So we cannot be slow. Sometimes, of course, you know, it happens, you know, uh, there are some very complex projects such as public-private partnerships, or, uh, but basically in the renewable sector, I do not know a single project where we have not been reasonably quick. 
I hope that uh, Gilad in a moment is not going to contradict me because I will have a lot of eggs on my, on my face if he, if he does that. Now, engagement with Israeli companies. Uh, it started uh, a long time ago huh, in the 90s, but for a while it was a bit limited to real estate. We did quite a lot with your real estate companies in, in Eastern Europe. At that time, we were not yet in other regions. Uh, then, you know, we did a bit of agribusiness with companies like uh, Tenuva. Uh, at that time, uh, they were uh, not yet uh, Chinese. Uh, uh, with also Frutarom in countries like Poland and Slovenia. But in the latest period, uh, there has been a lot of engagement in the renewable uh, sector. With, of course, Enlight uh, Renewable Energy on the Kovacica wind farm in Serbia, the Baigora wind farm in, uh, in Kosovo, with Energix Renewable Energy on the Banje wind farm in, uh, in northwestern uh, Poland. And we are uh, at the moment working again with Energix on more uh, wind farm projects in, uh, in Poland. Also with the Israeli infrastructure fund on the Potego wind farm in, in Poland, and probably I'm, I'm forgetting a few. So the engagement in renewables has been uh, determined and quite important in the last, uh, in, in the last few years. Uh, the event today, as you know, will focus on that industry and will focus on a number, on a number of, uh, of countries, because maybe we cannot do everything at the same time. So we will hear about uh, Poland, Hungary, Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Western Balkans. Uh, friends, if you have questions about other countries, do not hesitate, huh? because uh, we can also maybe go beyond, you know, uh, at least for a few minutes, the, the scope of that seminar. But at the same time, I guess we should focus also on what has been, uh, on, on what has been agreed. So we are at your disposal. We are at your service. Uh, we love Israel, we love the companies in, uh, in Israel and their dynamism, their uh, innovation, uh, and their desire to expand uh, beyond their borders. And now I would like to uh, thank you again for your presence. Thank you, Alon and Alon, again, and give the floor to my, uh, to my colleagues, uh, Hannes and, uh, and Josef for an overview of the uh, of our activities in the energy sector. Unfortunately, I have to leave you because I am in a virtual visit to a certain country at the moment, so I've got uh, 10 or 12 meetings a day. But uh, it was very important for me to uh, introduce uh, that seminar and to wish you to all the very best. See you, see you very soon. And I give the floor to my colleagues. Bye-bye. Thank you. Alon, Alon, and Alain. <laughs> uh, in a moment, we will share a short presentation, Anis and myself, introducing the EBRD. Um, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and also not familiar faces. I've spoken with many of you over the last few months. Welcome, glad to see you. Thank you for participating. Um, as Alain said, the EBRD is an international development bank. So we invest in developing countries in projects with added economic value, which of course includes uh, green energy. As Alain said, we were established in 1991. Uh, we are we're owned by 69 countries and two international institutions. Our majority shareholders are the European Union institutions and countries, but we're also owned by China, the UK, Japan, and some other countries, including, of course, Israel. Um, we've got a capital base of 30 billion euros. We're triple A rated by all three uh, main ratings agencies. Um, as you can imagine, just to give an example, 2020 was a very active year for us. So we, in 2020, invested uh, 11 billion euros through all our sectors. We're active in many different sectors, but we're also active in the energy and infrastructure sectors. Um, under the auspices of the Sustainable Infrastructure Group. We'll discuss here energy, but in infrastructure in general, we did in 2020 about 4 billion euros of investments. Um, we operate in, Anisk, next slide. Thank you. Um, we operate in, as, uh, as Alain mentioned, 38 different countries. 
So we only operate in these countries. That means that we can invest in projects in Israel or France. We can only invest in projects where there's a clear use of proceeds that benefits one of these countries. These countries include also the countries we'll discuss more later, uh, Southeastern Europe, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, Greece, the other countries I then mentioned, so North Africa, um, a few other countries in the Middle East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkey. Uh, and now Anas will go into a bit more detail about our act activities in the energy sector in particular before we move on. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, and let me extend my thanks to City Israel and Ministry again uh, for helping us uh, organize this uh, very exciting event for us. Um, so energy. We do quite a bit in energy as well. Um, uh, to date, we've invested in more than 400 projects uh, in the energy space. Uh, we've placed more than eight, uh, 18 billion euros of investment into these projects. Um, and we still maintain a portfolio of 10, um, 10 billion uh, in, the, in the energy space. Um, that's for the entire region that Josef was earlier speaking about. Today, we're going to focus on, on, um, on the European countries, but that doesn't stop you reaching out to us uh, should you have interest in the, uh, in the other countries we operate in. And I will briefly talk about uh, our engagement um, everywhere, not, not, not just in Europe. Um, as you can see, we are uh, uh, sort of fair, <laughs> fairly spread out in terms of geography and in, term, in, terms, of, um, in terms of our investment. Uh, renewables are uh, representing a huge uh, um, uh, part of our portfolio today. Over the last 10 years, uh, we have uh, been investing pretty much more than a billion a year in the energy sector. And, um, and this, that number has reached 1.7 billion um, in the last year. Uh, renewables, as, uh, as anticipated by Alain earlier, are, uh, are very much the theme for our bank. Uh, the bank has recently uh, approved a new approach, uh, which commits us to invest in um, green in green investments, and uh, and want and, and has an ambitious target to achieve uh, fifty percent of our investment being green by twenty twenty five. Um, this team, of course, by uh, by its nature, uh, immediately uh, becomes a focal point for achieving such targets. Um, we, are, we have invested and we invest across technologies. Uh, um, having said that, uh, because of these- Yes. Sorry. Okay, to continue. <laughs> um, I'm glad we're, <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad we're getting support already for the, for this part of the presentation. Um, uh, so we, we invest across technologies, um, uh, but uh, given the ambitions we have uh, and, and also the, um, the trajectory the world is taking, uh, we're investing less and less in, uh, in certain technologies and have stopped investing uh, in some technologies. Uh, and that, uh, that includes uh, coal uh, generate, for example, coal elect uh, electricity generated by, uh, by coal. Um, increasingly so, our investment is really uh, related to renewables. So this is, um, this is the slide that really showcases to you our presence um, across our countries of operation. Uh, so this is not just in Europe, we've done huge amount uh, both in Europe and in the, um, uh, uh, in the A Asian countries where we are presented, as well as North African and Mid Middle Eastern countries where we operate. Um, this slide doesn't actually really tell its full story. Um, and I would like to touch upon a little bit of what Alan said. Um, we're not only investors. Um, we can quite confidently say that most of these investments that you see on these slides have actually been instigated by, by EBRD through our policy dialogue. Um, uh, 
as 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 Alan said, um, started a dialogue in Egypt with which led to this uh, hugely successful Ben Ben program. Um, started the dialogue in in Serbia uh, to get to the uh, uh, the first renewable investments there. Started our uh, policy dialogues in Ukraine and Poland, um, and uh, followed that up with huge amount of investment. Um, and and frankly speaking, pretty much started the dialogue in re renewables in in most of these countries where we operate. So we. Uh, the reason we can do that is 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 also uh, be, because we are an institution that can oper operate um, across uh, uh, spectrums. Uh, so we can operate in the public space as well as the private space, and um, and that enables us that sort of contact with the authorities and the stakeholders to uh, to instigate this this dialogue. We are focused on the private sector. But the ability to uh, to work with the public sector really opens door to uh, opens doors to us to um, uh, to pursue this um, to pursue this dialogue. That leads me conveniently to um, to what we can do and what we offer. Um, as Alan said, we 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 do debt and equity, but we also do pretty much basically anything in between. Um, and um, and almost anything you can imagine to an extent that you know we can make a credible case of it. Um, so um, uh, we invest uh, 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 in, in in portfolio companies um, via equity. We in, we invest in projects um, via project finance loans. Um, we invest in corporates. Via corporate loans, we also, as I said, we work with with sovereigns. Um, uh, but more than that, we do this policy dialogue and technical cooperation uh, that helps us sort of bring everything together. Um, we can we can organize funds for technical assistance to authorities um, to instigate change in um, in uh, legislation to instigate change in the in the contractual frameworks. Um, we can support project preparation facilities. Um, we can um, engage in strategic assessments. Uh, so we really sort of uh, uh, offer a, a, a full package um, uh, that is really uh, uh, the machine behind um, uh, creating uh, the trajectory and the transition for the for the countries in which we operate in, um, and sort of uh, is is the motive behind uh, our original foundation. Um, we'll stop myself there, um, and and um, and and our intention later today as well will 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 be to try and keep this presentation short, so you can ask us as many questions as you want. Um, I could not be happier. To be introducing the next speaker to you, um, I, as Alan said, he really is a friend. Um, I hope he will be honest in the assessment of uh, of the way we deliver things. Um, I uh, I think he has found us receptive to ideas, um, and uh, and let's see how how receptive to implementation of all those ideas he has found us. So, without further ado. Um, uh, Gilad, uh, could you please uh, say a few words of uh, of how we worked with each other uh, in the in the past and how we are going, how you're hoping we will work with each other in the in the future? Yeah. Hi, Anis. Thank you very much. Uh, for, thank you for inviting me uh, uh, to say some notes here, and uh, I'm really happy to see many friends uh, from EBRD. Uh, here on the screen, uh, Anes, George, uh, Roxana, Francesco. So, uh, and I'm sure that uh, maybe I, I've missed some of the boxes in the in the Zoom. And uh, I think uh, it's also nice to see some familiar faces from Israel. And uh, I see that there is a lot of interest uh, in the in in this conference. So I'll try to be helpful, basically 
to share with you informally uh, our experience of uh, working with the BRD and I might say even give you a spoiler and say uh, our successful experience in working with the BRD. Um, and uh, if, if, if uh, there is a need, uh, I can also uh, um, refer to some questions uh, and, and make it even uh, more informal. Uh, in general, let me start by uh, just uh, maybe um, uh, naming the projects or the opportunities where we worked and cooperated uh, with EBRD until today. So uh, uh, until today, um, uh, we've uh, worked together in two projects uh, in the Balkans. The first one was uh, Kovacica that uh, uh, Alain uh, mentioned before. Uh, it's a wind farm uh, in the capacity of 105 megawatts that uh, we started to construct or uh, close financially at September 2017. Uh, it's quite a complicated uh, project uh, that involved maybe, I would say, the first wave of uh, regulation in Serbia. I'll touch it uh, uh, in a moment. Uh, and the financing comprised uh, was, you know, comprised of uh, several organizations. EBRD was, I would say, uh, the leading in many in many ways. But it was a syndicate, also with a commercial, uh, two commercial lenders, and also uh, a credit insurance company, Euler Hermes. So uh, all, uh, I would say, the stakeholders together um, were part of the challenge. That needs to needed to be managed, and uh, um, I'll touch it uh, afterwards in terms of uh, the role of the EBRD in such uh, in in such project. Uh, the overall uh, investment in this project was 180 uh, million euros, and uh, uh, EBRD part was around 50 million. Uh, the the second project was also in the Balkans. Uh, in Kosovo, so again, a, a country or um, a, an emerging country, I would say, that deals with the first renewable energy project with uh, a lot of uh, question marks regarding how to shape the regulation in a way that we will uh, will attract foreign investment and also be bankable. So again, an opportunity uh, uh, for us as a developer, uh, but also I think for a leading uh, lender like EBRD to uh, pave the way for renewable energy investment in developed countries, in developing countries. Uh, Selats was uh, the major uh, renewable energy project in Kosovo. Uh, again, a 105 megawatt wind farm uh, that uh, was uh, financially, I would say, closed uh, during uh, the end of 2019. It's still under construction, I would say, or maybe I didn't mention, but uh, uh, a Black Sweet project of Kovacica, uh, uh, with local name, uh, was already commissioned and uh, operates very successfully since January 2019. And since then, we also uh, had the uh, um, I think to overcome additional challenges during the, the COVID-19 uh, area and some regulation uh, uh, decision by the Serbian government. And again, I think it was an opportunity um, uh, to experience uh, uh, the way EBRD dealt with, uh, with these challenges together with us and uh, helping us to smooth uh, in many aspects, uh, I would say the situation. Um, so, in terms of uh, cost of a project, uh, Selats, it's still under construction, but it's going on very well, and uh, we all hope to uh, commission the project uh, by the end of this year already. So we will have two very large wind farms operating in the Balkans, financed together with EBRD. So maybe to say a few words about uh, our experience and uh, I think the benefits in working with the ABRD in the, this kind of opportunity. So I think the most important, I would say, observation would say that EBRD in, in both opportunity played the role of, I would say, the leading role, but also a role that is beyond the role of a typical lender. 
And in this regard, I would say, as uh, I think Anna uh, mentioned it uh, in terms of the policy dialogue. One of the things that they were characterized in both projects is that it was the beginning of the regulation in both countries and the government were considering how to find the right balance. Uh, from one, one side to protect their taxpayers and, uh, and uh, to create a regulation where they control, but from the other side is to create a bankable and also stable environment to the uh, uh, investors and the developers, but also to the lenders. And in this regard, I think the EBRD world was the most important. So uh, creating a dialogue together uh, I'd say first a direct dialogue with the government and the regulators, but also being, I'd say, uh, very receptive uh, to the comments by us as a developer and uh, I would say being even coordinated with us as developers on what will be, I would say, the right balance and the means to, to create this kind of equation between the different stakeholders. So the government, the regulators, and the consumers and the interconnecting uh, companies and uh, of course the lenders and the investors. So this was, I would say, one of the most important things. The, 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 in this regard, I would say that although sometimes the commercial lenders were the ones that provided the, the larger uh, trench of financing, still in, in many aspects, the role of EBRD in these kind of uh, countries and opportunities uh, was paving uh, basically the way for the commercial lenders to, to get into the transaction. And in this regard, it was very important and it helped us basically to, uh, to uh, uh, they, um, establish a, a very uh, commercially beneficial uh, uh, package that included uh, the ability to get uh, cost-effective financing from the commercial lenders that is packaged also with uh, attractive financing uh, from EBRD in a way that enables all parties to take part. So um, a, an additional role, I think, or a complementing role of uh, this uh, kind of policy dialogue is the, I think, uh, what we call the risk allocation. Basically, at the end of the day, uh, the financing and the regulation and the policy is seeking to allocate properly the risk between all the stakeholders. And in this regard, the, the dialogue on financing the project was uh, ongoing. So it's not a case of a closed package regulation where uh, both parties were to decide if they get in uh, to the deal or not and then negotiate a commercial uh, uh, terms for the financing, but rather ongoing dialogue with the government and all the stakeholders on uh, the main risk allocation of the regulation. So of course, I would say in this regard, uh, maybe Anis will agree with me that the most, uh, um, I would say the, the most important front in both projects were the PPA discussions, but not only. We discussed also the interconnection, uh, sometimes regulatory deadlines that were a part of the regulation and, and uh, posed some, uh, some challenges uh, to, to the financing. And, uh, and the, I would say the financing was uh, uh, advancing in parallel to the regulation framework. And I would say that financial clause was uh, in both cases uh, uh, the, the completion of the process in, in, in both regards and, and uh, in cases where uh, the, the regulation is being, still being built. And I think this is the case in all countries where there are uh, dynamic changes in the market that uh, requires constant changes in regulation. Th these, these are the areas where it's, it's very, uh, I would say, attractive to work together. Uh, if, if I need to uh, maybe uh, uh, to look on the new challenge that uh, may be the cases for a future uh, uh, cooperation between uh, Indite 
uh, or maybe your organization with EBRD, I would say that the main challenges today are, are driven by the need for government to lower cost of electricity to their uh, consumers, uh, comparing the old feed-in tariff regimes where, uh, uh, where the introductory uh, uh, steps usually in, in the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, developing countries. So if we look into the future, so we see that most, uh, most uh, countries would like to introduce more uh, market-based regulation and sometimes in developing countries, the market is still not acting in a way that provides the, the I would say, the degree of certainty that you will have in market-based uh, schemes or regulatory schemes in the developed countries. And I would say that uh, most likely this will be the challenge in financing the, the new project. So in this regard, uh, 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 I can see examples like the tenders in Albania or the premium-based uh, regulation that is uh, upcoming in Serbia, maybe uh, market-based regulation in uh, Romania in the future. And, uh, and we also, uh, uh, we also uh, 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 announced our, our intention to work in uh, Georgia where there is a kind of a mixed regulation between feed-in tariff and market price in certain periods of the year. So in all these, uh, I would say, examples that are uh, future examples, I believe that there will be a lot of place to cooperate for an organization like Enlight to cooperate with the BOD based on the same principles of uh, answering the new challenges that are facing us. Um, that will be, uh, to my opinion, again, more in the area of, of uh, introducing market-based elements to develop, uh, developing countries. And in this regard, I think there are some elements in which I think uh, a cooperation with EBLD for us can be fruitful. First, I think the uh, open relationship that uh, we have with EBRD. Although EBRD is a, is a large organization uh, owned by countries, for us, it was a very positive, uh, I would say, uh, experience uh, uh, to create the open and transparent and very, I think very sincere relationship that we have with the with the teams, either the the management and the and the, and the working teams. Uh, the other is the fact that I believe uh, uh, we found a balanced approach in uh, EBRD as a commercial lender. So I believe that uh, not always everything that you want can be achieved when you work with a, a commercial lender and especially an IFI. But we found the approach quite, uh, quite open and uh, we, although we had some hurdles and we had some challenges, I think at the end of the day, we overcame them very nicely. To, and I think this was assisted by the approach of EBRD that was transparent, sincere, and, uh, and balanced. And, uh, and, and I would say the last, and the last uh, reason is, of course, the focus that we see that was mentioned by uh, Anas before in terms of the, the geographic focus. There is, uh, I think, a lot going on in this market. So I don't want to spoil in light as uh, you know, <laughs> the opportunity is uh, as a lot of competitors are here on the, on, on the screen, but you know, I'm joking. I think there is a lot of potential in the countries uh, of, uh, you know, of focus for EBRD and there is a very nice opportunity to create the market there with the challenges that uh, we will all face. So uh, I hope it was helpful. And uh, I'm open uh, to question whether here on this panel or if you want to uh, contact me uh, directly, I'll be happy. Thanks a Thank lot, you. Gilad. Uh, Beverly, shall we just crack on? Yes, yes, please do. Uh, Thank you so much, Gilad. Um, there, will be a, there will be opportunity to ask questions. Um, if I could maybe ask you to refrain from um, questions whilst we're presenting, um, and we'll try to be 
try to be short in our presentations. I'll give uh, the word to Julian and Anna, who will talk you through um, uh, the Polish market, as well as Hungary and, and some of the other markets they're leading on. Thank you, Anes, and thank you, uh, Gilad. Uh, I'm Julian Modwit, and I'm uh, within our team, uh, Regional Head for Central and Eastern Europe. And this covers uh, Slovakia, Hungary, Baltics, Poland, Belarus, and Ukraine. And since very recently, uh, Czech Republic, uh, since uh, our board has approved the BRD's re-engagement uh, in the country. Um, most of these countries uh, in Central and Eastern Europe are, are what we consider a TBRD uh, more advanced market. And today, as Anes has just said, uh, we'll focus on Hungary and Poland. Uh, po Poland has been uh, and remains today one of the key countries for our team, uh, particularly when we, we start talking about renewables and, uh, and green transition. Uh, in Hungary, our engagement to date has been a bit more opportunistic for a variety of reasons. But, uh, but there has been a recent momentum with a, a clear objective to transit to the green transition uh, with ambitions uh, in, in solar in particular through the, the new meta tender that we are very keen to support as well as a, a private to private uh, uh, regulation which enables projects to sell directly to end users. And that's an area again that we will be very eager to look at. In Poland, we've, uh, you, you've seen that on the first uh, slides being presented by, uh, by Anes, but for us, it's really the biggest market to date in terms of renewables, we've, we've, we are going to reach this year probably two gigawatt of uh, renewable installed capacity that we would have supported. Uh, and, and, and again, Poland is a very good example uh, of the way we, we do see this market and the way we engage. We are, we are committed to our countries for the long term. And we are there during both the good, but also the, the, more, most, the more challenging times. Um, and Central and Eastern Europe to date in our renewable portfolio accounts for roughly 40% uh, of our renewable uh, investments. And this is uh, mostly driven by, by Poland and uh, a little bit by Ukraine, uh, but not, uh, not at the moment because we are going through the bad times at the moment in Ukraine, uh, which uh, we, are, we are used to, as I was explaining. So um, in Poland this year, we are going to exceed the 1 billion investment uh, mark in renewables. And uh, on this slide, you see that uh, well, in, the, in this region, we are interacting with um, many uh, key players, including a lot of uh, Israeli uh, partners uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we, are, we are working with, including obviously uh, Enlight, uh, the, the Balkan project have been mentioned, but we are working as well on other opportunities uh, at the moment. Um, and, and we try to focus on these markets because they are more advanced mar markets for us. We need to really justify and, and bring additional value. So typically, we are trying to uh, address uh, some of the more challenging uh, structures, both whether they, they are more challenging from a financial standpoint or from a commercial standpoint, or, uh, or because we try to promote new products uh, in the markets. Uh, and, and more recently in, in, in the Baltics and in Poland, we've been very active on, on green bond and uh, sustainable bond issues, uh, as well as uh, on, uh, on privatization of, uh, of state-owned utilities. Um, I'm going to, to move to the next slide, uh, which uh, um, shows the, the context for, for both Poland and Hungary. The trajectory is clear, is very clear for both countries. It has to be green. It has to be green. Both uh, uh, are EU countries, and the EU is committed to the clean energy transition, uh, fulfilling, obviously, the goals of the Paris Agreement, uh, meeting the, the Green Deal objectives, being carbon neutral by 2050, and each country uh, <laughs> Uh, I have to, uh, to prepare a 10 year NECP, the Energy and Climate Plan, that is going to, to, to show the way they, they, they want to, to pursue to, to achieve these objectives. Uh, and, um, and if we move on to the next slide, uh, we see that uh, these countries in Central and Eastern Europe remain uh, very much. Uh, uh, energy intensive uh, and uh, especially compared to the average of the EU and uh, and this shows uh, the, the scope for for further improvements here in terms of uh, energy uh, sources as well uh, many of these countries here you have uh, you have as well Czech Republic and uh, and Slovakia I think shown on this slide uh, and uh, this shows as well the the challenges ahead in terms of uh, 
transiting away from from the fossil fuel sources uh, and, uh, and and as well some of them are relying still on, on aging uh, nuclear capacity which will have to be decommissioned and, and replaced with uh, uh, for for uh, a lot of the, the capacity uh, with uh, new renewables. Um, so um, um, I think that will create obviously challenges for this country uh, and not only uh, economical challenges, but social and political when we, we speak about uh, transiting away from coal. Uh, but we, we are convinced uh, at TBRD that uh, despite our name, we, 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 are, we, we are obviously a uh, we have quite a diverse shareholding structure and we have a, a unique positioning um, and, and still having very tight uh, relationships obviously with the EU who remains our uh, uh, largest single shareholder. And so we, we have a quite unique positioning with a local presence in each of the countries we do cover and our operational model, which focuses on both the public, the private sector, as it was mentioned before, and covering the whole capital structure and all kind of uh, capital market products that uh, may be used by, by our clients. We think that we are very well uh, positioned to support our countries in this, uh, in this transition. Um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to leave the floor now to uh, Anash Mieliska, who is working with me uh, very closely, uh, particularly in Poland, where she's based. And she's going to, uh, to go in, in slightly more details for Poland and Hungary. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julian. Uh, indeed, uh, as, as Julian mentioned, uh, across our region, uh, countries face significant legacy, be it uh, reliance on coal or, or gas or obsolete uh, nuclear power. Uh, in this context, Poland is clearly one that, that still faces a huge coal legacy with over 70% of the, of the energy mix still being based on on hard coal and lignite. And uh, while that creates a huge challenge, both in terms of economics and uh, EU targets and social challenge, it also creates a true opportunity to actually redesign the energy system into what can be described as a modern uh, energy system uh, based predominantly on, uh, on renewables. And that's really what's, uh, what's happening. Poland started off this journey back over 10 years ago, setting uh, initial targets for 2020 at around 20% of renewables share in the uh, final energy consumption. Now with the EU uh, developments that were mentioned by Julian previously, the ambition ha has, been, has been increased to 32% uh, of the renewable share uh, in, in uh, electricity consumption by, by 2000, uh, 2030 and, uh, and similar uh, and slightly lower level in the total energy, energy consumption. Uh, this uh, this uh, transition is actually happening. The last uh, the last two years have given a powerful start with the with the new CFD system being successfully implemented by the by the Polish authorities, which sets a strong base for development of renewables, uh, both onshore wind and uh, and solar energy. Uh, we were delighted to see that um, uh, Israeli Infrastructure Fund uh, wa was one of the first uh, beneficiary of this uh, of, of this support system, and and has been brave enough to 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 invest uh, in in the largest onshore wind farm in Poland. Back two years ago, we have uh, supported, no, this, supported this this player. Uh, what uh, what we can see going forward is the continuation of this trend, uh, and uh, and clearly the new uh, auctions are already announced to take place this year. Uh, there will be two rounds of auction, one in June and and uh, the second one in the fourth quarter. Uh, the authorities are are trying to negotiate with the Commission a continuation of the program through the, uh, through the subsequent couple of years. But what we see also happening is this in this country uh, is uh, are are also the niches that can be developed without regulatory support, 
they can be based on the PPA market that is picking up uh, quite, uh, quite dynamically, as well as, as so-called behind the meter installations. We clearly see also a huge offshore potential with uh, over seven uh, gigawatt of, of plant capacity and the first wind farm expected to be commissioned in 2025. This is only achievable with strong um, regulation and uh, we, we are glad to see this, uh, this regulation being, being enhanced. Uh, recent enhancement include accommodation of, uh, of storage so that uh, hybrid installation can participate in future auctions. Uh, similarly, there are proposals to relax the distance law which, which currently prevents further rollout of onshore wind capacity. Uh, EBRD has, has assisted Poland in the, in the renewable journey from, from the beginning. Uh, we hope to reach two gigawatts of uh, total capacity financed uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we have already committed over 900 million uh, dollar to uh, that translated in, in over 3 billion of total, total investment. It is, of course, as in other countries, um, supplemented by the policy dialogue uh, which we uh, where we uh, try to safeguard uh, the the interests of uh, of private players in the in the sector uh, the the second country in central europe hungary uh, while slightly smaller and and uh, and uh, potentially one or two steps behind when it comes to to the, the rollout of new renewables faces slightly smaller challenge, but that cannot be uh, underestimated as well. There is a, a significant ambition to roll out a solar capacity, which similarly as in, in Poland has become green parity also in Hungary. And uh, in, in this respect, Hungary uh, also plans to increase the share of renewables to at least 21%. Uh, in the next uh, in the next decade, with uh, PV capacity reaching over six uh, six gigawatts, uh, this is supported by the METAR system, an auction based uh, uh, CFD type system, which is being rolled out um, in Hungary. And uh, the the last uh, last auction was well oversubscribed. Therefore, everyone is expecting uh, even more competitive uh, levels of tariffs uh, uh, to be offered this year with the with the next round of auctions happening in the in the second quarter compared to Poland we believe Hungary still offers uh, an investment opportunity at slightly higher uh, uh, return uh, of uh, of on investments as uh, this market is not as crowded as Poland has become over the last two or three years. And, and we, we do strongly believe that uh, uh, Israeli uh, players who have, uh, some of which who have already successfully uh, proven track records in the region can, can actually uh, help also this country to, to transition away of uh, conventional energy and, and develop an energy system based on, based on solar. Uh, let me just mention the, the successful cooperation with IIF, where we, uh, which, uh, which is one of the investments that, that opened up Polish, Polish non-recourse market uh, back two years ago uh, to, to sizable investments. Uh, we were delighted to support the Israeli Infrastructure Fund and Mashaf Energy in um, in this uh, in this investment, and hope to uh, expand further our our cooperation. Also this year, we have also seen very dynamic uh, uh, very dynamic activity of of Energics, whom we supported a few years ago, and who has been successful uh, in the in the recent renewables auctions in Poland. So we we are de delighted to see that uh, that Israeli clients, uh, Israeli investors, are actually helping our region to to move away uh, from fossil fuels and. Uh, 
and um, can be can be competitive in in those markets and we will be delighted to to support them further through their journey thank you very much and on this note i will i will hand over to to my colleagues to cover some of the other countries yeah, i think george is taking over now yes let me let me uh, Yep, we got we got George now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me pass over to George Gaurius then. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me and let me also share my screen. Uh, Hello, hi. My name is George Jowis, and uh, I'm currently the acting director for the Energy Europe team, but I'm also the regional head for energy for Southeast uh, Europe. So I'm delighted to present uh, to you uh, three of the core uh, energy markets in Southeast Europe, uh, Greece, Romania, uh, and Bulgaria. I'm also delighted to see a lot of um, uh, of you joining this webinar, a few familiar faces and few actually uh, potential uh, new relationships that we are working right as we speak. So uh, without a lot of delay, I will go straight uh, to the presentation starting uh, with Greece. Greece uh, uh, is a market with an installed capacity of approximately 21 uh, gigawatts. So let me just move this, 21 gigawatts. Approximately half of it is conventional coal, oil fired and, uh, and gas, and the remaining half of it is hydro and renewable. Uh, a lot of part of the installed capacity belongs to the state-owned utility public power corporation and private uh, investors are focusing mainly on natural gas and renewables. On the supply side, the, the state-owned utility PPC dominates um, the supply market and has approximately 67 to 70% of the retail uh, market share. Greece is a net importer of electricity with a domestic production of approximately 41 terawatt hours a year, uh, about a quarter of it uh, coming from renewable and the net electricity uh, consumption of 51 terawatt hours a year. Uh, because of that uh, need to import, Greece is very well interconnected with all its neighboring markets uh, having good interconnection with Turkey, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, Albania, and Italy, and a plant interconnector with Cyprus and potentially Israel. Um, the, the Greek electricity market is uh, fully liberalized, and since uh, last year it has adopted the target model, which introduced a new uh, intraday, day ahead, and forward uh, market, and a balancing market operated by the Greek TSO at Mie. the All the other markets are operated by the Hellenic uh, Energy Exchange. Uh, renewables have been historically been supported through feed-in tariffs. And since 2018, the Greek government introduced renewable auctions uh, where renewables were participating in the electricity market in the day ahead and they were receiving a 20-year contract for difference uh, as a operational support under a contract signed with a renewable operator now called uh, DAPEP. Going forward, in terms of the strategy, the Greek uh, energy strategy is driven primarily from the EU target, and it is actually one of the most ambitious decarbonization strategies across the, uh, for sure, the countries of, that we operate, but also within EU. So in its recent National Energy and Climate Plan, Greece set a very ambitious target to phase out all existing coal capacity uh, by 2023. And the one uh, coal plant, which is currently under construction, is expected to be converted or closed by 2028. Actually, last week, PPC, the owner of that plant, uh, said that they're even planning to close it earlier by 2025. So this National Energy Climate Plan also set a uh, a high target of renewables uh, by 2030, increasing their share in terms of total energy consumption to uh, 35%. And that translates to approximately 
8.7 gigawatts of new renewables that will come uh, into the Greek energy system. Uh, part of that renewable, approximately 2.1 gigawatt, are expected to continue receiving operational support under CFDs that will be auctioned and the Greek government secure the continuation of the auctions until 2024. The remaining will have to be supported through, uh, without any subsidy through market structure, either bilateral PPAs or contracts with uh, traders or with suppliers. There are also a number of opportunities in the uh, transmission and distribution grids. The TSO has a, a very ambitious uh, network development uh, program uh, aiming to connect a lot of the uh, non-interconnected islands, some of the large ones like Crete, uh, that will not only uh, uh, provide some supply opportunities for equipment uh, for those investments, but also will increase the demand on the uh, interconnected uh, energy system since it will add the demand of those islands which are now not part of the interconnected system. There are also similar opportunities on the distribution, which is part now of PPC. Uh, this um, distribution system operator is currently uh, in a process of partially being privatized um, to, to some investors. Uh, this process will, will conclude later in the year and it has an ambitious uh, uh, investment program uh, focusing mainly on uh, modernization, digitalization and smart meters. I would like also to mention a very important opportunity uh, Greece has for investors uh, through its huge potential on offshore wind. EBRD is currently uh, supporting the Greek government to finalize its uh, offshore uh, uh, wind uh, regulatory uh, scheme and the associated uh, laws, which we expect they will be voted, will be voted in the, from the Greek parliament by the end of the uh, summer and that uh, will define the rules of licensing uh, the offshore uh, activities and provide some ideas of how uh, offshore wind will be remunerated. Uh, another potential opportunity of course may come uh, from uh, a, a, another regulatory framework that will cover uh, or provide for hybrid solutions on the non-interconnected islands, those islands that will not be expected to be interconnected with the mainland. And uh, we hope the, the Greek government will announce also this year a regulatory framework to support investments uh, in hybrid system providing renewable and storage solutions to those islands. Other opportunities uh, are some still uh, uh, privatizations, uh, remaining privatization on the on the gas distribution and gas supply, which also expect to be concluded uh, later uh, in the year. And I will add potential opportunities on energy, but not only on energy activities in the coal dependent region, driven by the uh, by the closure of the coal production. Uh, Greece, together with the rest of the European countries, I have prepared uh, what is called Just Transition Master Plans, which uh, is aiming to support investments in the coal affected regions. And those investments will be supported through EU funds under the Just Transition Mechanism. So there is a near mark of 5.5 billion to support uh, investments in those regions. Moving to Romania, Romania, in terms of size, Provide it's a similar uh, market uh, with 19 gigawatt of net installed capacity and uh, almost one third of that capacity is uh, coal and gas, one third is hydro, 7% uh, nuclear, and approximately 23% is wind and solar. 70% of that capacity is owned by, by state owned utilities. Romania uh, is, I would say, a balance in terms of meeting its demand. Uh, so own generation of approximately uh, 53 uh, covers the, the energy consumption of 55 terawatt hours uh, per year. Despite that, uh, Romania is very well interconnected with its neighbors and uh, having uh, strong interconnection with all the neighbors and the plant new interconnection uh, link with uh, Moldova. On the distribution uh, and supply, there are eight main DSOs with the largest being the state-owned utility Electrica and three other private companies owned by NL Chase, which are currently in the process of uh, being sold to Macquarie and, uh, and E.ON. 
And in terms of electricity market, uh, the market has been fully liberalized since earlier uh, this year. And uh, OPCOM, the uh, independent electricity market operators, operates a day ahead, an intraday, and a forward market, uh, and also a green certificate market. The balancing market is operated by Transelectric. Uh, I will, the, the first wave of renewables or the existing operating renewables had been supported through green certificates, a scheme uh, which is still in, in place for only existing operators. Um, that, uh, of course, scheme had also uh, some difficulties through some adverse regulatory changes we, which reduced the demand for green certificates. So there have been a lot of oversupply of green certificates over the coming years and not all of the uh, uh, operating uh, uh, plants could sell their green certificates uh, either to the OPCOM or bilaterally. Uh, and of course that created a stall in new investments in uh, renewables which have uh, not been supported under this scheme since 2017. Uh, moving forward, uh, similar with Greece, the, the, the strategy of the uh, Romanian energy sector is driven also by the, uh, the EU targets and is currently under revision. Uh, the latest uh, National Energy Climate Plan of Ro Romania sets a, a target to increase uh, its renewable energy, uh, the share of renewables uh, as part of the total energy consumption to 30%, and that translates approximately to 6. 9 gigawatts of uh, new renewables. Part of that uh, renewables, we hope, will be supported through uh, CFDs. Uh, the EBRD is working with the Romanian government to implement a CFD auction mechanism, and we hope first auctions will start uh, sometime in 2022. On the, on the supply and distribution, uh, the market uh, Sorry, supply. Uh, we've got. Uh, sorry, I think I mentioned that. Uh, and uh, I would say on the uh, on the transmission distribution, the, the main investments are focusing on on, on networks modernization, uh, with significant investment plans from Transelectrica and the privately owned DSOs. And like in Greece, there is also a, a good potential for uh, offshore wind capacity. Uh, and uh, the Romanian government is in the process of discussing in the parliament its offshore uh, wind uh, regulatory scheme, which will provide for uh, auctions, uh, for, for licensing with the concessions to develop offshore wind uh, uh, awarded uh, through auction, but also through, uh, through uh, bilateral uh, discussion. And of course, uh, there are opportunities to uh, invest in the coal dependent regions uh, as part of the Romanian Just Transition Plan, a, a forthcoming potential IPO of Hydroelectric, the largest owner of the uh, hydro capacity in uh, Romania, and potential opportunities through the restructuring of the main utility which owns the Romanian's core power plants, uh, CE Oltenia which is in the process of preparing its restructuring plan, aiming to close part of its uh, coal uh, plants and converting some of them to gas, but of course, increasing uh, its share of renewables. And moving quickly to, to Bulgaria. Bulgaria as a market is slightly smaller with 12 uh, gigawatt of uh, installed capacity, about 54% is coal and nuclear. 10% gas, 20 hydro, and approximately 16% is renewable. The market is uh, again dominated by the state-owned utility BEH, Bulgarian LG Holding, which uh, owns most of the, uh, which owns the nuclear, uh, most of the hydro, uh, and some of the largest coal plants. Uh, historically, Bulgaria has been a net uh, exporter of electricity uh, in the region with uh, and uh, domestic generation of approximately 45 terawatt hours a year, uh, approximately 20% of it produced by renewables and a, a, a demand of approximately 35 terawatt hours uh, a, a year is a well-connected market also 
with its uh, uh, neighbors. Uh, however, the market uh, is not fully liberalized, so households still uh, are subject to regulated uh, uh, tariffs, but there is a, a well-functioning uh, day ahead intraday forward market operated by uh, IBEX. And uh, renewables historically had been supported through feeding tariffs, uh, but uh, since 2017, uh, those uh, feeding tariffs have been transitioned to a support uh, uh, where uh, converted, I would say, to a CFD support with renewable producers participating, selling their output to the IBEX, uh, to the exchange, and receiving a contract for premium up to the previous level of the feeding tariff. And in terms of targets, uh, they, I would say Bulgaria probably has the, the least ambitious uh, target with slower uh, phase out of, uh, of coal uh, and the target under its uh, national energy and climate plan to increase renewable to approximately 27% uh, out of total energy consumption. That will translate to approximately uh, 2.6 gigawatt of new uh, renewable capacity by 2030. And uh, However, there is no any support, uh, unfortunately, uh, provided for this capacity. So this capacity at the moment is expected to be developed on, on merchant uh, terms uh, and again bilateral PPAs or uh, PPAs with, uh, with uh, traders. Bulgaria also has a, a good potential for uh, offshore wind. However, they've been very slow and not yet uh, contemplating an offshore wind development uh, scheme and of course there are a number of other investment opportunities again on the coal uh, affected regions but also on energy efficiency and investments in the in the grid and in all those three markets Greece has been a major uh, investor over the years we've provided approximately 2.5 billion of financing for energy projects and focusing uh, as of course we mentioned a lot on renewables. We actually kick-started the renewable markets in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, and we helped uh, to scale up the renewables uh, in Greece. We also work with some of the state-owned utilities, providing loans uh, linked to reforms. We have recently supported the Greek PPC on its first high-yield sustainability-linked uh, bond. We've also provided uh, uh, assistance to improve the governance and climate-related financial reporting, again, working with PPC to implement uh, the recommendation of uh, the task force for climate-related financial disclosure. We also worked a lot on improving uh, connectivity and trade, not only financing uh, new interconnections, but also investing in some of the institutions as we are investor in the Hellenic uh, Energy Exchange. And the key takeaways, I would say, uh, for those markets is very high uh, decarbonization uh, targets, so significant needs for new renewable capacity over the coming year, a significant potential uh, for offshore wind with Greece and Romania probably a bit more on the forefront, uh, and uh, the markets are well interconnected and well functioning uh, in terms of electricity product. And uh, in terms of investors' interest uh, in Greece, it, there are uh, currently, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a market looked by many investors and returns tend to be uh, relative low, but Romania also is getting hot even in the absence of a, a support scheme, whereas Bulgaria is still less overcrowded. So uh, I will finish my presentation here and of course we will be open myself and my colleagues Roxana Simon who is also attending and Svetlin Pislensky uh, to answer uh, questions on Romania and Bulgaria respectively. Thank you. Thanks a lot George. Uh, we'll move swiftly to um, to a last uh, presentation um, that uh, Francesca and I will cover which is the region of Western Balkans. Um, Francesco, it was I who was supposed to share right, the, the screen. So let me try and do that. OK. 
Okay. Thank you, Anas. Good afternoon, everybody. We are very glad to be here, especially building on a very productive and uh, successful uh, experience we had with Enlight. Uh, and uh, thank you to whoever was involved in organizing uh, the, this event. So very briefly, I mean, in a similar context of uh, Southwest Europe, uh, I mean, uh, I am uh, working uh, together with Anas in uh, Western Balkan 6, uh, which is uh, Albania, Kosovo, Serbia, uh, Montenegro, North Macedonia, and uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, and then covering also Croatia. Um, by saying that uh, you know we are in a similar context about the uh, least developed markets, uh, we wanted to present you this uh, snapshot. I think that in these graphics you can understand uh, what is the current situation in in the Western Balkans. And uh, even if the graphics stops in 2019, not much has changed in the in the past couple of years. As you can see, uh, the, the the light blue hits the hard power plant, and the dark blue is the thermal power plant that. Uh, let's say in a certain way accounts for about the 60 percent of uh, 60 or 65 percent of uh, yearly uh, consumption in, in the western balkans uh, as you can see from the from the horizontal uh, red line i mean almost all generation was built in the 90s and since, since then uh, in the past 25 years uh, there is an evident lack of investment even if in 2017, with, uh, with uh, mostly our also support, uh, uh, new renewables penetration has been seen. This is the, the, is the little red tongue on the, on the top of the graphics. Uh, start to develop a renewable market in the region. I mean, uh, much more needs to be done, especially by 2050. I mean, we have to make this mission impossible to, to let's say, replace about eight giga or production from thermal with the renewables. So uh, this is uh, something uh, quite challenging. We are not uh, afraid of this. I think that we have uh, uh, our way to make this uh, mission possible. And uh, you know how we do this in uh, you know following our energy strategy. We have uh, three main pillars. Uh, one is the decarbonization. Is uh, you know following what uh, George previously say. All these countries they are committed to reduce and they commit to the production of uh, of uh, thermal power plants from coal. And um, our main purpose is to scale uh, the shared renewable energy, and not only financing, but also, as uh, Anas will present you later, uh, giving a strong support to all the authorities in. Uh, uh, terms of external consultant to help them to draft uh, uh, and to prepare and to tender auctions, uh, competitive auctions in the selective market. At the moment, we are uh, actively involved in Albania, in North Macedonia, in Serbia, and Kosovo. Uh, on top of that, also, we are involved in gas. We, uh, in line with the Paris Agreement, we are uh, selectively uh, reviewing uh, ongoing projects in the region. And uh, where it's feasible and in line again with the uh, with Paris Agreement uh, reduction emission, we, uh, we will be reviewing important projects that will uh, uh, reduce the, the emission and will uh, utilize gas as a transitional fuel uh, in a view of not locking in uh, those countries to, to natural gas in the future, but accommodating also compatibility with the uh, hydrogen source when this would be uh, economically more viable. As well as, as in Western Macedonia and Greece, we, we had just started a diagnostic for as a pilot project in North Macedonia, where basically external consultant will support the government to understand what would be the impact of the decarbonization and the decommissioning on the thermal power plant and mines and coal mines in the region and how additional investment, not only in, uh, in energy, but can be, uh, let's say, deployed in those regions that will be, uh, they will have to, let's say, reinvent and restructure the, the economic uh, development plan. Uh, the other two mark, the other two pillars, so one is supporting, the third one is supporting the state-owned utilities, which are, you know, an important backbone. And uh, in order to have those countries to, to in a certain way cooperate and, uh, and support us in our in our efforts of decarbonization, we need to uh, include them in the pictures, uh, but uh, in a way that we transform those companies in, uh, in a more, let's say, commercially viable companies, the same that we are having in Albania and uh, in Serbia, 
buying, uh, uh, implementing corporate and government action plan, uh, also climate change resilience project, where basically we are trying to uh, transition those company to a more stable and uh, economically viable standing. Uh, the central pillars for us is, uh, of course, the electrification of the markets, where we are basically supporting uh, uh, the improving infrastructure by building cross-border interconnectivity and integrating different markets. And as, as well, at the same time, we are providing uh, smart grid and uh, smart electricity uh, meters to some of our clients. Uh, one of our best project is uh, in Montenegro, where we finance the distribution company for uh, deploying a rollout uh, a full uh, project for uh, implementation and, uh, and installation of sport metering. And uh, at the end of this year, we should have 85% of the consumers in, in Montenegro uh, utilizing smart meters that it's uh, above the average of, of the European Union. And then I go to, the, to my last slide uh, before, uh, before I, I give the floor to, to Anes. This is a bit in summary what we have been done in the past few years. Uh, I mean, starting from Serbia in 2017, where we have been uh, uh, heavily involved in making bankable the, the, the tender uh, uh, organized by the authorities, where we finance uh, Dolovo and Kovacica with a light. Uh, it was a, a lot of, uh, let's say, interaction in terms of negotiating PPA and uh, different, uh, let's say, standard uh, uh, futures on the agreements. And then uh, we think that, uh, you know, as, as a light also mentioned at the beginning, uh, how our, let's say, in interposition and uh, discussion and, and policy support has been also appreciated, not only for, uh, from them, but also other investors in, uh, in the region. Uh, Similarly, in Kosovo, where we financed the first two wind farms after more than 30 years of investment, Anes was in the front line with uh, Bayagora and the Kitka wind farms. And I think that also there, you know, similarly, like in, in Serbia, we've been, uh, let's say, creating a, a good, uh, viable uh, initial environment, although those, uh, those uh, investment were in a, with a PPA, with a feeding tariff, as it was mentioned earlier, also the Western Balkans will move away from, uh, from this system and they will move to CFD system. In North Macedonia, we started again with, uh, with uh, some practical uh, investment on uh, decarbonization path. And one of these is uh, 10 megawatt in a dismissed mine in uh, southern western part of the country which has been followed in these days with, with a tender for 100 megawatt for a private public partnership with, uh, that was been uh, actually uh, last week awarded to a Bulgarian and a Turkish company to build uh, in two lots, uh, 50 megawatt each. And uh, I think that it's, it's a good example of what can be replicated in the region in the many of the coal mines cause uh, you have already all the infrastructure uh, near the thermal power plant and the coal mines, and then uh, you know you create some economy of scale by avoiding uh, uh, investment in uh, uh, rehabilitating the area for other purposes, so while those areas can be still utilized for uh, uh, sustainable development as a solar power plant. Very briefly, in Bosnia, we supported Smart Grid with uh, with the two. Uh, distribution company in Republika Srpska. In Montenegro as well, we financed the first uh, wind farm in all the region. Uh, back in uh, uh, 2016, we were working with Aqua and then we financed to, we managed to, to finance the first wind farm as well. There are a lot of uh, interaction uh, with the authorities in order to make the, the system viable. And more recently in Albania, where we started with the auction, we had uh, two auction, uh, uh, the first one for 100 megawatt and the second one for uh, uh, 140 megawatt, uh, each of them uh, below three euro cents for kilowatt hours. Uh, both of them are won by a French uh, uh, company, which is uh, also an EBRD, early EBRD client. And a few weeks ago, we have signed uh, the first uh, uh, floating uh, solar project uh, in, in the region. Uh, it was a small project uh, uh, of 10 megawatt with the state-owned utilities on commercial basis. But we demonstrated that with the several different technologies, we can uh, uh, improve the, the, the climate change resilience also the state-owned utilities. And here as well, I think that in the region, 
there is opportunities and not only for state authorities but for uh, for a private public partnership to invest also on uh, this kind of project so without uh, spending more time on our project uh, in, in specific i give the floor to to anes and uh, for presenting uh, what is our focus now in the in the region in terms of auctions thank you very much and happy to answer questions afterwards thanks Fante. um so basically these next couple of slides are essentially what is next in Western Balkans, at least what uh, what we think is, is next and appropriate. Um, tagging on a little bit on, on what Gilad was mentioning is uh, there is a lot of push towards uh, market uh, liberalization um, and especially by our uh, by our friends uh, at the Energy Community Secretariat who are actually who we are actually working hand in hand with on on these assignments that i'm going to touch upon briefly uh we've we basically have a memorandum of understanding with them as to how to uh, based uh, effectively sort of establishing principles uh, based on which these these auctions uh will be built um and uh, and we think this is the right tool to attract private investment uh into western balkans and also the right tool to transition to a phase where uh, um, where we will um, be looking at projects which are on a fully merchant basis and operating in a, in a market, um, the, the Balkans at the moment uh, the sort of the fundamentals for for a market still have not been reached. Um, the, uh, the the liberalization of of the market is yet to yet to take place, um, and in, in most countries. Um, the, um, the sort of first step unbundling of, of, of the state-owned utilities has not yet taken place either. Um, so in order to sort of get to that point, we believe it's, uh, uh, it's important to have a, a mechanism um, that investors can trust in um, and, um, and, um, and, and, and financiers as well in order to Really deliver ultimately um, on this new renewable capacity um, that needs to come into Western Balkans in huge amounts, as, as Francesco was talking about earlier. And we, you know, we think private sector uh, will and has to play a, a very big role here. Um, the uh, uh, Francesco has already mentioned we had extraordinary results. Uh, through uh, two Albanian auctions that we have helped help support um, that have yielded uh, quite extraordinary uh, bidding prices. Uh, it doesn't reflect the full story. Um, those, those projects have been uh, auctioned on a basis that the offtake will be guaranteed in one case for 50% of the power and in the other case for 70% of the power. Um, whereas the rest of the uh, offtake is actually meant to be going on to market or uh, the sponsor is meant to find a solution for it outside uh, the government framework, uh, which <laughs> in itself is, is bringing quite a bit of challenges, but we are already in the, um, uh, in the thick of that as, uh, as, a, man as a lead mandated uh, bank to uh, finance those two, uh, well, finance the first of the successful auctions and we're hoping to be the lead bank um, in the in, in both projects. Um, we have effectively um, started um, an auctions dialogue in all of our um, uh, uh, countries of operation that are uh, uh, part of energy community, uh, not just in Western Balkans. Uh, those countries include also Moldova and Georgia uh, that George covers um and um and a couple of others um uh, these assignments are you know as i said are meant to sort of uh create uh, uh, a bankable platform uh, a transitional platform that both investors and and, and financiers can um, can believe in and invest in um and are quite ambitious you know in in western balkans uh, the auction size is is meant to be between you know 250 and 500 megawatts um, in Kosovo, a small country, but still quite ambitious. We're trying to uh, potentially get up to 150. And in Albania, we're working already on a third assignment with the government uh, for a wind farm uh, for 150 megawatts. 
Um, I will probably skip sort of, I'll, I'll sort of leave this in the background and um, uh, for a few moments, but skip really talking in detail about this slide. Um, would like really to sort of kick off the, the question round um, and, um, and end it here with the presentations. Uh, please do let us know if you have any questions um, about the, uh, the countries we have presented. I've seen that Anna has already addressed a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and please let us know if there's any follow-up questions to those. Um, but I'd like to open the floor to, um, to everyone to let us know if any questions. If so, Gam, she'll be great, come on. Uh, yeah, let's hear your questions, please. Maybe I can kick it off. Um, so, um, yeah, I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. No, that's fine. You can start. No, no, oh, I, I was I was going to pose a question that was probably going to be of interest in terms of sort of this merchant move towards merchant. But please go ahead um, with your question. Okay, so uh, I come from the arena of uh, agriculture. Uh, I'm an agronomist, and I would like to find out if there's already some actions or activities uh, related to agriculture. Uh, so uh, to hear a little bit from your experience would be nice. There is, um, however, we, for that we would, uh, we would need to probably put you in, in touch with our colleagues. Um, we have a sector team who, who uh, specifically deals with um, agribusiness and sometimes we cooperate uh, depending on where the project evolves to uh, and if the use of agriculture is ultimately uh, for production of electricity as well then we get involved uh, but we certainly do cover it quite extensively um, that sector so depending on on, 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 yeah. on the type of project you're thinking of no, I'm talking uh, actually about uh, uh, using uh, renewable energy energies, of course, like uh, greenhouses with uh, uh, implementing uh, solar energy or uh, using uh, wind energy for agriculture uh, projects, uh, things like that. Uh, I can see um, that Gregor has already some thoughts on that, so please, Gregor. <laughs> Uh, Anas, perhaps I can comment here. Well, my name is Grzegorz Zielinski. I'm a regional director for Central Europe and the Baltic States. And I've got a, a, a privilege of seeing a slightly wider picture of our activities in the region. Uh, and just to address uh, your question, I would say that for the bank, supporting of renewables and energy efficiency becomes an integral part of any activity we're doing in any sector. And that obviously relates also to uh, agriculture. Uh, uh, and some good examples of how we tend to support energy efficient agriculture production is the support of the IPO of a Lithuanian company that we have done last year uh, uh, that uh, was actually a dual listing on Vilnius Stock Exchange and uh, uh, Warsaw Stock Exchange with a view of helping the company to enhance the green uh, activities, but also activities that were mixed with uh, innovation. That was a really exciting example of uh, uh, making use of uh, data being available for this uh, biofood producer and putting that data or making the data available to the end consumer, so that through a QR codes that are put on the piece of package, uh, whoever buys the product in a supermarket can know exactly where that piece of uh, peas or carrot was uh, or mushroom was produced, how much electricity has been used, what's the carbon footprint on that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think what you may be more interested in is are uh, the activities of how renewables can. Uh, support uh, energy efficiency of food production and how uh, they can reduce dependence on, on grid power. Uh, and that clearly depends on the country, 
we, we see enormous potential in a country like Poland for um, biogas. This is the area which, when we compare the Polish market to a neighboring Germany, uh, where, where we can see thousands of small scale biogas installations, these are simply missing, not just in Poland, but across Central Europe in general. So for, I don't know whether you would have a very sort of more specific question I, I could address, but uh, uh, all I would like to say, whether that's the case for um, agriculture, manufacturing and services, uh, our work with municipalities, uh, I've seen Anna answering the question on energy efficiency on, on, on the chat. Everything that we do effectively has a green angle, which becomes even more important for the EBRD. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see we have a question on what are our investment criteria. Maybe um, a question could be made a bit more specific, um, depending on the type of project. And Josef, I'm sorry, but I can't read Hebrew. So maybe you can uh, identify uh, or the person then. Avigail? Sorry, Avigail? Well, actually, in the meanwhile, we can answer a question that Anna answered specifically about Poland, but we can make a bit broader. As we know, Israel is rapidly becoming a world leader in battery storage. Um, okay, so I see Avigail answered, but let's finish this first. Where do we see opportunities for battery storage in our countries of operation? Um, Anybody Anna, here Anna's to start? <laughs> Anna, uh, hey, look, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I will, uh, I will start from, uh, from the, let's say, more developed part of, of, of our region. Uh, indeed, we, we, we do see storage being, uh, uh, being explored or contemplated across our countries of operation, where we see it uh, being uh, piloted these days predominantly are st uh, small scale storage solutions for, for the electricity grid. And then also um, attempts to, uh, to integrate storage to mainly solar, um, uh, large scale solar in installations to take some advantage of the, uh, of the peak, uh, peak prices and intraday uh, irradiation. Uh, changes. So th these are the two two main main areas where where I do see storage picking up uh, across uh, the, the um, Baltic states, uh, Poland and 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 Hungary. Uh, now maybe you, maybe someone from from my colleagues could could add for the for the other countries. Yeah, I think I mean in in for Western Balkans. I mean I think it's still. Uh... The cost of it um, is still a little bit prohibitive, um, and um, and the uh, and the solution it offers um, not entirely yet clear. There might be one of the governments who eventually decides um, that it's that's that's something they would like to pursue at least as as a pilot, as Anna said. Um, um, but at the moment, we're sort of not. Uh, seeing uh, a very active project discussed in, in, in that region, uh, perhaps a bit more in, 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 in Georgia's region. Uh, uh, I, I, there's probably um, some discussions in, in Greece, especially. Maybe I can add something on Romania. So um, also like in Romania, we are uh, considering assisting the Minister of Energy <clears throat> in drafting the um, like a guide or utilization guide for the modernization fund. And this modernization fund is not so well known such as the recovery fund, but is also quite a high fund, which is, is for Romania is between six and 8 billion euros, which part of it will be used for the energy storage. And so this, if the Israeli investors are interested in on this topic, for sure, a part of this fund will be dedicated to energy storage. So it's worth uh, considering this for the future. Thanks, Roxana. Thank you, mm -hmm. Roxana. Do we have anybody else from the EBRD team that wants to talk about storage? 
Uh, perhaps we can oh. we can move on to the question of PV. Uh, yeah. So what would be our investment criteria for PV? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Shall I go first? Maybe the the, an, the answer it it it, it depends. Um, it, it depends on the market. It depends on the on the contractual uh, framework. It, it depends on the on the dynamic um, in in a specific geography. Um, what we can say is uh, is PV is something that in that a technology that is now very well known to us at this stage we couldn't have necessarily said that sort of five years ago uh, but it's a technology that you know we have supported quite heavily over the last few years um, across our region uh, to be honest but especially in um, in North Africa and Middle East uh, as well as in Ukraine for example um, and um, and you know we are an investor who can um, who can who can uh, uh, offer project finance um, in all of these jurisdictions. Um, we can offer longer uh, term longer term loans, um, and we can be competitive in order to to have these projects ultimately come online. I think it's kind of a, a broad question. A broad answer, sorry, uh, but hopefully a, a help, helpful one. I, I don't know if George, Julian, maybe you wanted to add anything to that. Um, no, I think I think you're right, uh, Anes. It depends a bit on the context, but typically we would we would really look at uh, the competitiveness of the asset, uh, the, the just just to make sure that uh, what where we start having quite a significant portfolio of uh, of solar assets, and we would did clearly benchmark whatever new project we are looking at compared to, okay. to, to this and make sure that we are comfortable with, uh, with uh, the level of cost and that, uh, and that uh, the ultimate break-even is, uh, is competitive in relation to the market price, depending obviously on the commercial structure or support mechanism that uh, would be applicable to, to, to the relevant market. I see we have a question here from Gen Farkas from Afcon who's asking, and we'll turn this to the whole panel, which markets where we see the most opportunity, both, both opportunity and it's ripe, a ripe market, but also high returns, where the market hasn't gotten too crowded yet. We will probably all say in our market, <laughs> in, in, in our entire, in, in all of our markets. <laughs> but if you had to pick and choose, just sort of targets, candidates for, for a gold rush. Still, in all of our markets. <laughs> it also depends on the uh, appetite. I mean, there are so, so, some of, let's say, more advanced markets, which still, because they don't have uh, support, uh, still, especially for those companies, for example, that can develop their own projects, yes, the, the returns are much higher. If you are buying existing developments, even on those markets, for example, that I described earlier in Romania and Bulgaria, uh, if you're buying, uh, let's say, licenses, you may see that they're getting hot, even in the absence of a support scheme, because uh, a lot of people started looking. Uh, but as I mentioned, probably Bulgaria is the, the least uh, uh, focused, uh, market for uh, but Romania because of its size if you can develop it yes you may be able to, to seek uh, higher returns but auctions wherever uh, we are dealing with auctions uh, yes the IRRs are, uh, are getting to single digit uh, uh, figures uh, for sure it depends on the on the risk appetite and the investment horizon as well, because, uh, for example, a market like Ukraine, which is in crisis now, has potential for further renewables. Clearly, it will take time. It will recover. It has been the gold rush over the last few years. Now the country is a bit in crisis because they didn't manage very well the transition to a new support scheme. But the, this this will get better as we've seen. It, it, it has Poland has, got, has gone through the same crisis. Bulgaria, Romania as well. And uh, and uh, and so the, the this is really dependent on well, what is your investment horizon, what is your risk appetite, uh, and in terms of risk returns, again, depending on uh, you know countries like Poland are, are very competitive now, very because there is a lot of appetite from investors. Uh, this, but the same would apply, for example, to. To, uh, to, to different markets in, in Morocco, uh, yields are, are very uh, very low as well because there is a lot of appetite. Usually the PPAs are guaranteed by the state. 
So it's a low risk uh, proposal, and so the, the, the returns are lower as well. So it depends on the context. I think each market is, is very, uh, have all, each market has its own specifics and, uh, and, uh, and dynamics. So, um, so happy to explore uh, these markets individually. I think uh, that's uh, probably the best uh, way to answer this question. Yeah, no, I agree with both as well. I mean, some Scott uh, wanted to ask a question, but... <laughs> but not only risk appetite, so it's also risk perception, you know, we, we all see risk differently, including investors, you know, there's some investors already actively um, exploring uh, merchant assets, even in Western Balkans, even though we as a bank still think there's, there's a transition period to go, but, you know, um, people ultimately believe in the upward trajectory of, of power prices and, um, and you know, um, are, are going in that direction. There's, um, there's a couple of questions about Romania, Roxana, maybe yeah. for you. Um, storage, Jonathan uh, Wattenberg. being a, a sort of not supportive of storage and also about agri bit, agri. Yeah, so on, on the storage, I, I don't think we don't, we don't have a, a, a policy on storage yet. But as I mentioned, um, keep an eye on this modernization fund is a EU fund, a good chunk of this fund will go to energy storage solutions. And from what we have seen in, on the market right now, few of the smaller size solar and um, wind projects have associated a small storage facility as well. I have seen this as like a combination of wind, uh, solar and storage on site as well. So I think there will be investment opportunities. This is, maybe not something for the next two, three weeks, but it's uh, it's coming for sure. But through, but through in, in those markets, the advanced, we have not yet seen the TSOs or uh, government yet uh, promoting support scheme for storage in the form of battery. But, uh, you know, hopefully we may uh, find that uh, they will consider providing a, a framework for, you know, attracting storage solutions in the form of batteries. And Roxana, there was a specific question oh. on agrivoltaic. Does that name mean anything to you? I'm sorry, it doesn't to me. Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan, do you want to explain a bit more? Jonathan Wattenberg? Hi, guys. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, agrivoltaic is the mix of uh, uh, PV plus uh, agriculture. So uh, dual use uh, of agriculture plus even like PV, as uh, we see in other countries, uh, Italy uh, and uh, Germany. So it's an up and coming trend. And I uh, wanted to know if uh, there is any uh, direction that the, the government wants to uh, implemented the dual use of agri agricultural plus uh, uh, PV. Thank you. I have to say, I'm, I'm not up to speed on this, but maybe our colleagues in the agri, agri team would know much more uh, on this topic, but we, we can definitely support everything which involves photovoltaic being on a farm or um, I'm sure we can find a way to, to finance it. Um, but if you have a, pro a specific project in mind, maybe you can send it over and you can have a look. Yeah, and I think Gregor is most knowledgeable about agrivoltaic <laughs> uh, projects uh, that, uh, than the rest if, of us. So I think you can probably offer more. If I may just very briefly, uh, I, I, I think it really depends which country are we talking about. And uh, I think the key elements here is the uh, regulation for land usage. Uh, in some countries, we actually see a strict restrictions on uh, a dual use for arable land. Uh, in some countries, we actually have very tough restrictions on uh, acquisition and management of arable land. So that creates issues. I don't have a specific knowledge on country by country, so I cannot uh, comment specifically here. Uh, but again, going back to what I said earlier, any solutions which are uh, doable within the current regulations and which increase the generation of renewable uh, electricity uh, by any type of business that applies also to uh, agriculture production uh, could be supported by EBRD. So far, again, not quite a, a mainstream activity yet for uh, 
for this team and generally for EBRD, but something definitely that we will see uh, coming our way. Uh, and this is sort of a cross-sectoral application of renewables uh, for Agri that has been uh, mentioned twice already. And uh, by the way, apologies for not giving the name of the company I referred to earlier. Uh, the company name is Auga. Lithuanian uh, business that I've mentioned uh, that EBID has supported through its IPO. Uh, but we also see uh, application of renewables through uh, rooftop applications for any sort of uh, uh, storage facilities. Logistics is a booming sector, as some of you may know, in, in Central Europe and not only, uh, which is linked obviously to increased e commerce, etc. etc. Uh, so, the putting PV panels on top of logistics centers is a, is a big business across EV and the countries of operations. Uh, we see the same with public buildings uh, uh, and cities. Uh, or, or large manufacturers, which also uh, try to find uh, uh, an additional use of uh, the areas that can, they can offer. Uh, so without going to any other examples of, of, of sectors, uh, we're not really talking about large scale or utility scale generation. It's mostly uh, a generation of renewable electricity for own use. But we, we do see this project. And that just one more comment on uh, on, on storage, if I may. Again, not quite an expert in, in the area, but uh, mm -hmm. this team, which I was used to work for in the past, has made uh, some very interesting power storage transactions in late 90s and early 2000s. We were talking about large scale pump storage uh, installations. This days is all about facilitating greater penetration of renewables. So when we talk, we, we talk more about balancing power and, 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 and what role gas can play. But we also see uh, other non-obvious storage solutions, again, outside the sector brackets of this team, but in terms of electrical vehicles and management of charging stations, uh, trying to couple the intermittent renewable energy power generation with the uh, charging stations and, uh, and use of electricity for EVs is another big element that uh, is booming going forward and the bank will look for opportunities to finance those developments in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Gregory. May I, may I, may I? Yeah, sure, Nissan, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, the, the logistics and the rooftops, uh, this is really our business, but usually it's a small project. Uh, and uh, the bank appetite is for larger projects than those small ones. What is the program you can find in such uh, uh, projects or is a bundling of uh, different projects into a major size? Whatever is it, uh, or we are usually executing PVs, EVs, and batteries together. So that's uh, that's uh, a full system, uh, and usually the, the the investments are between half a million to two million euros uh, maximum per project. If we go if we're off top of one megawatt battery and EV chargers, so can you elaborate? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean. The I don't know if uh, it, it may have missed my attention at the beginning of, uh, of this session, uh, but the bank usually tends to, to finance directly larger projects, uh, you know, something in the region of 20 million of EBRD financing, maybe a little bit exactly. less in smaller countries. Uh, and, 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 and the areas that you just mentioned are unfortunately outside our ability to finance directly, which doesn't mean we don't do these projects, but we do them through financial intermediations, intermediators, sorry. So we work with local commercial banks with programs that are linked either for general energy efficiency or general efficiency and renewables at the same time. And a good example of that is uh, a program what, that we run in Poland, uh, it's called Paul Geth, Green Enemy, uh, Energy Transition Financing Facility, in which 
Polish commercial banks used the EBRD financing that has been provided to them for on lending to smaller projects. And they may be half a million euro, they may be two million euro, but definitely too small for our direct engagement. Another area where EBRD tried to work with someone who is active, actively act, acting as a um, consolidator of smaller projects is the EBRD work with municipalities. Where under the EBRD Green Cities program, we provide financing to municipalities and then it's up to municipalities to identify uh, a small project here and there that they can finance uh, uh, using the EBRD or larger EBRD loan that has been provide, provided. We would also be willing to work with project uh, accumulators on, or, or the companies that would try to, uh, to come up with a portfolio. But for that, we need critical mass. We have been in, in talks with Polish uh, uh, power utilities that simply wanted to extend their presence and, and offer new services to municipalities, for example. Uh, with financing, EBRD financing to be provided to the utility in the first place, and then utility, power utility, using that financing for capex at the small scale for small and medium size uh, municipalities, which is just simply too small for us to work directly with. But I cannot see a reason why such a role could not be played by an independent market player that would be strong enough locally to work with municipalities and to try to come up with critical mass of the projects that EBRG could finance on a portfolio basis. I, I hope that explains. Thank yeah. you. We, we will bundle. Thank you, Nissan. I saw we had a question from Sako Abubakir about our involvement in Africa. Yeah, and there was a question about Serbia as well. Um, all, all the presentations will be shared, so uh, and the, our details um, are on those presentations. So please feel free to reach out uh, if you want to talk about a particular opportunity with any one of us. George, you want to you want to take Africa? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the Africa expansion, um, the the reason uh, is purely. It, it, because our mandate has not been extended. Uh, so initially the bank, as mentioned by Alain, was uh, started to support the, the Eastern European countries transition to market economies, then gradually expanded uh, from the uh, Arab Spring uh, to North Africa. Now there are some discussions about expanding to Sub-Saharan Africa, but I will say they're still a bit uh, early. So. Yeah, the bank is trying to expand its mandate and maybe one day we will also look at a few selected sub-Saharan, uh, but it's also a decision from our shareholders. Uh, so it's not an operational decision, but uh, a decision from our shareholders. And just to reiterate again, you know, uh, happy to put you in contact with any of our colleagues that are operating um, in the, in the North African and Middle East region, as well as in the Central Asian uh, Caucasus region. Um, uh, all those markets are very active um, and, um, and all those markets um, need quite a bit of investment to decarbonize. So um, do let us know if, um, if there's interest in any of those. Happy to put you in touch. Okie doke. Okay. I think Maria has called it. <laughs> um, hopefully this was useful for um, uh, everyone that participated. Um, it was very welcome by us, um, given, given our experience to date. Um, and um, hopefully the, the, the network of our, of our relationships with uh, Israeli companies can grow, grow exponentially from here. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you. Uh, all your time and uh, feel free to reach to uh, any of us uh, if you need uh, to discuss something bilaterally. You know, it's not always easy. 
on those webinars. So we will be available to help. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You much. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Anna. Thank you.